Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Film Tangent Show. Like and subscribe. Comment what you want us to watch and review. Or just, you know, say something cute. <laughs> give us, a, give us, a, give us a, an opinion. You know, we'll we'll roast you for it. But we're back, everybody. We're back. We're back, everybody. Listen, uh, person listening. Um, yeah, welcome back. This is Film Tangent Show. Also, person listening to this, um, I dare you um, to comment <laughs> anything. If you are listening to this, if you're listening to my voice right now, 40 seconds into this episode, if you're listening to this, if I didn't edit something out, it might be less than 40 seconds. If you're listening to this, I dare you to comment something. Jake here gave you a prompt. It can be your favorite movie. It can just be a, it can just be like a, a, a meme, whatever you want. You know, share it. We might make fun of you. If it's a movie, we will review that movie in this podcast. What a great thing. Think about that. This is a, a burgeoning podcast. This is just two cool, rad fellas. And we will yeah. give our time and attention to whatever your favorite movie is. We will review it. We will talk about it. We will shout you out. I dare you to put a comment in that comment section. If you don't put a comment in that comment section, you're a coward. Especially if your name, <laughs> especially, especially if your name is anything that rhymes with Langston, <laughs> then you, <laughs> you're a coward. <laughs> or if your name rhymes with any name that I actually know of any human being that I've met that listens to this podcast in secret, whoever the fuck you are, comment something. We'll watch the movie. Yeah. There's no, in, yeah, it, don't know deep within you that if you're listening to this, that I love you, and that I am, I am challenging you because I, I, I know that you can do better than this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you've ever met Edward and I, ever in your lives, we're, we're, we're you're on that list. We're expecting you to come. We're expecting but, you. But uh, that was the sound of yeah. my, me opening my beer. I said that before I started drinking. So whatever. So I, I can only go either up or down from here. I guess we'll see within the next couple hours. Dude, you got a disease, man. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, we're back. Everybody, like okay. and subscribe. Um, hit that bell icon so you get notified of every new episode. Um. What were we going to start with? You were talking. You were talking about Facebook or something. Yeah, I have a. Fa I, I want to share um, a tale about my Facebook journey. I your Facebook journey. <laughs> yeah, this is my Facebook journey, bro. Listen, I and, and you can share your Facebook journey with us too, Jake. You know, it doesn't have to oh, be yeah. just me. Um, oh, dude, it's coming to an end real soon. I'll tell you that. I got Facebook. Um, I couldn't tell you how old I was. I was maybe. 12 something like that um yeah. maybe 13 i remember when i got facebook and i got facebook just out of peer pressure i've never been one for social media funnily enough even though we are well like generation z or whatever we're the generation of people who have grown up like having access to social media and whether it be facebook or myspace or whatever the hell was before that you know and everything that's come since we've been the people who've had access to those things and yeah. I remember when Facebook came around and it was just peer pressure. People just wanted me to have it. I didn't want to fucking have it. I made one and then I friended everybody that I knew, obviously. And then at some point around the age of, I don't know, 17 or 18 or something like that, I deleted Facebook and then I made it again because I was like, fuck all these people. <laughs> I will meet new people. <laughs> I'm done with yeah, all these yeah. people and all these updates. And then I made a new Facebook. And so I made a new Facebook. And since then, my Facebook is filled with everybody that I met in college. So this is, it, I basically catered like a more professional Facebook because I don't have a Facebook with like my childhood friends and all that BS. Like my Facebook only has like literally people that I met in college and then professional connections that I've made. Mm -hmm. But then the shitty thing about my Facebook is that it has the people that I met in college. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah right Cause I, right because there's some good and some bad right because as it goes <laughs> and it goes for you the listener um and you know who you are if you are somebody that i met in college most people that i met in college are fucking buffoons and so <laughs> and so every time that i go on <laughs> whoa <laughs> every, time, every time i'm editing this podcast i'm not editing this out i don't regret anything that i'm saying right now every time that i go on facebook is someone 
saying something lame. It's yeah, just lame. lame. It should not be called Facebook. It should be called lame book. Lame book. It's like, <laughs> let's, just, let's just have a competition. Nice. Let's just have a competition to assess who is yeah. lamer amongst us. You know, that's really what it feels like to me. Just like this attention seeking lame competition. Yeah. Now, as far as this journey that I've had with Facebook, you know, at one point it really just became a. Facebook gets a, you know, I get a notification, I get like a one or, you know, I get like a, a number on my Facebook icon on my on my phone telling me there's some notification for you here. And so I would just, on a daily basis, I do not post on Facebook. I don't look at people's stuff on Facebook. I don't like anybody's shit on Facebook. Well, it's like something like really wholesome, you know, like somebody getting engaged or something. Shouts out to all the folks that have gotten engaged recently. You know who you are. Um, yeah. But... Stuff like that, you know, I would go in there and then just kind of come out. Whatever wasn't like in the first two or three things in my feed, I wouldn't interact with anything else. I would literally just go in there, make it so that the fucking notification number would go away so that my screen could not have fucking little numbers in it. And I would go out. Per this, you know, use of mine of Facebook, I remember that I talked to you about it and you said something wise, which was just fucking build your Facebook. And I said, you know what, man, (laughs) you know, like, I'm not going to delete my account. Like the account stays there, but I'm like, I'm I'm just going to delete the app. So if I ever have to go into this Facebook thing, I just have to go like facebook.com and then, you know, add steps to this whole thing, which makes it something that I use less. And so I makes it harder to just get that dopamine hit that you get when you just click on it and don't even do anything. Exactly. And so I did that. I deleted Facebook per Jake's um, um, suggestion. And this happened live on this podcast. I deleted it Facebook. <laughs> and yeah, so man. subsequently after that, Facebook started texting me. They started texting me notifications. And the notifications went along the lines of like, we've noticed you don't have Facebook anymore. So here's a notification telling you that person X, buffoon, posted, <laughs> posted something. Something lame. Yeah, something lame here in lame book. Like, interact yeah. with it, please. And so then I was met with this situation where I was like, oh, fuck, how do I make this stop? Do I have to go back into Facebook.com? What do I do? I just decided to do what any reasonable other human being would do. I let it be. Yeah. <laughs> I allowed yeah, yeah, yeah. it to continue to happen. And so yeah. every day I would just get a text message from Facebook telling me, Lame, Lame Derson Landerson, Posted a, right. a lame post, you know, <laughs> and so I just continued to allow that to happen until eventually I met new people, and these new people said to me, "Hey, man, add me on Facebook," and right, I said right. to these new people, "Well, you know, uh, I don't have Facebook um, on my phone." Beautiful. And they said, "You don't have Facebook on your phone. How will you add me on Facebook?" And I was <laughs> like, "Well, that is not my problem." And so yeah. people then started saying to me, well, sir, I cannot f- find you on Facebook. And I said mm. to people then, well, search me while I'm here next to you and I'll help you find me. And then eventually right. I will go on Facebook and I will accept your friend request. And this yeah. continued to be the way that I went about this until I met a person that I was kind of taken aback by. And I was like, fuck, I have to add this. I have to add this guy on Facebook. This is painter guy. Um, I was like, I have to add this guy on Facebook. And so I was so dreamy. You just had to add him. Yeah. And so I downloaded (laughs) Facebook again and I added him on Facebook and I was like, you you know, you and I are friends. I got his phone number. Um, cool guy. Name is Patricio. Uh, shouts out to you, Patricio. Um, but I added him on Facebook and because of him, I downloaded Facebook since I downloaded Facebook again and I reinstalled it on my phone. I have not deleted Facebook again. And for some reason, Facebook stopped notifying me about things, meaning I don't get text messages. I don't get like a a one on the icon. I get nothing from Facebook. I just Mm -hmm. have it installed on my phone. And the fact that Facebook doesn't notify me about things anymore has led to me using Facebook more often (laughs) because I'm curious. And I'm like, I'm curious if there's some notification there, if there's something going on there. I'm just going to go in there and see that there's nothing there. So it's weird because it's like a it's like a it's like a backwards. What is it? What did you call that? Like reverse psychology with me and Facebook. Um, Yeah. Dude, big big Zuck knows how to get you back, man. Yeah, but that has been the evolution of my of me using that thing of just kind of like, 
Yeah, it always ends back up on lame, lame book. It yeah. all that's all, always how it ends, dude. You're always back there. With that, that's how it ends with everybody. And so I'm back on Facebook, and now here live on this podcast, I would like to say that I'm going to delete it again. But I don't yeah, know I, I don't know if I will. <laughs> I, don't <know> if, <laughs> I don't know if I will. Was it? Yeah, so I'm going to – a couple things. I'm going to go ahead and agree with you about the lameness of Facebook. Um, what I've been noticing lately the, – the lamest things I've noticed lately. One, there's a, <laughs> there's a, there's a, 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 a teacher uh, who went to – who taught at our, the school, the college that we went to who would be – remain unnamed. But this teacher – I won't even give the gender uh, of the teacher. This – teacher keeps doing what i suspect is making up stories things that they <laughs> overheard things that they overheard at a cafe things that interactions that supposedly occurred they're getting creative you know things that they've seen in public and they post them and people love these posts and they're the lamest posts Ever, dude. Ever. I've sent a bunch to you where it's just like, oh, I overheard. Yeah. This is a conversation I overheard in a cafe today. And it's like, that's it. You know, and it's like, I overheard someone, you know, saying, you know, such and such. And the other person said, I don't know, bro. And, you know, and then like, it's like, this didn't happen, dude. Mm. This did not happen. You did not hear that. None of this happened. You know, it's just like people make shit up constantly on Facebook, man. It is so annoying. And people fall for it. It's like yeah. – I'm not saying 100 percent of it is made up, but I think a lot of it is made up or exaggerated. I think some of it is full-on fabricated. What do, they, what do they call that? What do you call that when somebody like <laughs> embellishes like facts or like – uh, tall tales. I don't know. Cause, White cause, lies, exaggeration. Yeah, it's like that guy's exaggerating. He's like, he's like, made, oh, you he... gave the gender, dude. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. It doesn't matter. That doesn't really narrow it down. But <laughs> that person, that person. I think people who listen, who went to our school, though, will probably know who this yeah. is. But I don't care. Like, I, I don't think it's like, I don't think he's like a bad guy or anything, but I do think he's like making stuff up on yeah. Facebook. And it's like constant. I mean, I would send you those screenshots. Like, it's constant. It's daily. And it's like 40 likes, 50 likes, 60 yeah. likes. It's like, guys, stop giving this person attention. It, right. It's sickening. Well, but you know, and, you know, go ahead. I was just going to say, well, go ahead, because I'm going to bring something else up. So, I want to hear what you have to say. I was going to say, it's like, you know what the funny thing about it is, too, that it's like, it's attention farming. F yeah. F for, but it's like with no actual, like, big brain part of it. Because, you know, like, if you're, on Red, if you're on Twitter, you can have Twitter blue and be, like, rage baiting and attention farming and get paid. But it's like, on oh, Facebook, yeah. you're not getting paid. You're just, you're just there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know. I know, man. Yeah, it's, it's insane. And um, another thing, another very lame thing that I've seen lately that I saw was it was this specific person. This person I really I, – I don't think you know who I'm talking about, so I'm going to not gender this person either. But this person <laughs> went to our school. I don't know if they were there when we were there, but they're in that like network, you know. Yeah. And they lately, at least one time I saw, like they – I shit you not posted on their story like a Q&A thing and were like answering questions like to the camera, yeah. like, you know, not even writing out the answers, but like taking a selfie video of themselves and, and answering, answering them. Yeah. I'm like, who do you think you are? Like, do you think you're who are you, Brad Pitt? Like, get the hell out of here. You know, it's it's it is so fucking like. And it shouldn't. And here's the thing. Th this is the conclusion that I'm coming to. This shit is a waste of time. I cannot, you know, I can't, I, I can't, because I'm wasting time too and mental energy by getting like irritated or rolling my eyes at it. I mean, I know, pre I can already hear people saying, well, Jake, if you don't like it, you don't have to have that. You know, I, I know, I get it. It's just things that I've noticed that I think are really corny. That's it. But here's the thing I don't, I don't want to notice them anymore, dude. And I have been strongly considering deleting my account. And same with Instagram, dude. 
because deleting them. Dude, I want to become. Here's the thing, man. <laughs> I have come to the conclusion that social media serves no function. There's nothing. I'm, what good have I gotten out of it? Because you know, you're like, oh my god, you. There's that thing in your head where you're like, oh my god, I don't want to lose all 600 of these connections or whatever. For what? What good? Have any of us gotten out of social media? Who have we met through social media? I've never met us. I haven't met a significant other through social media, right? I have a significant other right now. Didn't meet her through social media, right? Haven't hung out with any of the pe- most of the people that I'm in, in my network who I would have hung out with anyway. You know, it doesn't matter if, that if you and I are Facebook friends, dude, we still would have been hanging out over the past four years since we graduated. And I like the idea, dude, of just being a ghost. No one knows what I'm doing or what I'm up to, and I don't know what anyone else is you know, up to. I'm gonna... it's, no, it's none of their business what I'm up to, and it's none of my business. It's none of their business what I'm up to. It's none of my business what they're up to. I'm going to challenge. It's gonna, just not. I'm going to challenge you by saying this, Jake. Yeah. It is that if you had not had Facebook over the past, since we graduated four years, mm-hmm. I wouldn't be your friend anymore. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I knew, I knew. <laughs> <laughs> I just knew you would have been so uncool, you know, you didn't have Facebook. I have to say Facebook something, Facebook. though. I have to say something. And it is that, yeah. one, I, I use social media like an old person in the sense that it's like, with Facebook stories, I didn't know they existed until recently. Until recently. <laughs> I didn't know yeah. people were like bothering to put stories on Facebook. How strange is that? Because it's like, Instagram is owned by Facebook, you know, or by whatever Facebook yeah. is. Um, I forget the name of yeah. like the, the overarching company, but it's owned by it. And Instagram is like the place where people put their stories. But I guess they just like, I guess they thought like, well, Facebook might as well have it because it's like some people have Facebook and not Instagram. But dude, yeah. I did not know people were putting stories up on Facebook. And then when I see stories oh, on Facebook, sure are, I'm always like, to what end? Like, to what end? Who's looking at this? I don't look at them. <laughs> I just see them there, and like, what is this about? It just feels like a the way, like a weirdly like wrong forum for it. Yeah, it's just so strange, man. It's just so strange to see stories up there. But then the other thing is that I've seen a trend recently. I don't know if you've been aware of this or if you've seen this, but I keep seeing a trend of people making like a long winded. This is what I've been up to. <laughs> Post. yeah dude yeah that's okay that's I've another seen an yeah. uptick on that like an oh my uptick God. on those posts have you you've noticed an uptick on yeah. that yeah oh those are the worst the, i hate those with a passion dude like and, and you know when i say a passion like it doesn't actually make my blood boil or anything like that like i i really you know i want to put out there like i'm not sitting here scrolling like getting mad at people but i just i think again i think it's super super lame you know i hate those dude little life update here stop yeah. stop yeah. i'm gonna stop you right there no one cares, no and, it's one cares. Like, and it's like dude and, it, and it's like i don't know what motivates people like i really don't know what motivates people to do those life updates i, I don't know i feel so disconnected with like the the motivation you know because it's like for instance not to go too much into my life but i feel like i've done a lot of things <laughs> that would give me probably like a pass to be like, oh, I'm going to fucking make one of those, like, live right. update videos. Because there's always these people just saying a bunch of horse shit. Like, oh, and I went to the dentist, and the dentist did a cleaning, and he found a, a cavity, and they patched it up, and, and I moved to Florida from right. Georgia. And it's like, oh, great for, great for you. It's like, yeah, dude. this life has been, life's been a crazy ride yeah. over the past year. And then, yeah, and then, like, some little clever quip at the end. Oh, God, dude. I know, man. It's so bad. No, I same here. I could have done so many of those, man. I mean, I've you know written a bunch of like I've written some books. I've you know done a, a an animated television series. Like, there's a lot of shit I could do. I mean, dude, just as a self published author, it would have been really easy for me to do one of those corny ass like Facebook story Q and A things. Oh yeah, oh like, dude, hundred percent. You know, for those two, it's like. Is anyone? I don't think for a second anyone's actually sending questions in. I really do think that person made up questions. <laughs> they just and they like, have they have like themselves. a burner account and they just like ask themselves yes. a bunch of questions. One hundred percent. I think boy. that's. What, 
I'm like just to like look impressive, sure. and then you then you go through that, and you're like, oh my god, like people are really interested in this person's life to this extent, dude. Because here's the thing: it was like it was like five, between like five and ten Q and A, like questions answered, mm-hmm. and I was like, nobody is submitting this this many questions to just this like civilian, which is what we all are civilians dude no one is submitting all of these questions to this person it did not happen i swear to god just like that teacher that went to our fucking school dude who taught at our school they are making shit up i'm telling you and this is what dude you're making this this shit up that just reminded me of um (laughs) the master one of the greatest movies ever um yeah 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 i mean yeah, it's just it's ridiculous, man. And I've come to the conclusion where it's like this. There's nothing. I'm I'm not missing anything. Nobody's going to miss me. I'm not going to miss anyone else. And if I do something that's really worth other people knowing about, they'll find out. Yeah, they'll find not out. Not through Facebook. Yeah, they'll, they'll find they'll out. Find if out. I get a book published, they'll find out. Well, I don't Jake, need fucking Facebook. Jake got arrested? <laughs> right, right. He's yeah. in the news. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. So I'm, I, I talked to my girlfriend about this too. I really think I'm gonna do it, dude. What, I'm, what I'm waiting on, I don't know. I'm keeping Snapchat. Snapchat's a very useful communication. Yeah, tool. Snapchat is a very useful communication tool. I like Snapchat. And it's there's like, not it, as it much of that you. crap. Yeah. yeah, Snapchat. There's not as much lameness. There's some. There's some. But you know what I've got a, gotten addicted to lately, though, actually, is is blocking people on Facebook and Instagram who like I don't like I you know like you really have to block them just mute them dude no i block them because i don't <laughs> want them to see my stuff either like people from my past yeah. who i'm like why am i friend because you know you there'll be someone like who you hated in high school who i will told send you, you like, i'm not friend. friends with anybody in high school well here, but this is the thing for a lot of people for people who have have the same facebook like who didn't go through that first deletion process that you did yeah. i'm telling you you'll get people who or even way later, like you can have people like who you hated in high school or college. I don't really, I didn't really hate anyone in college, but in high school for sure. You, right? And like they'll friend, right? They'll friend you and you accept. And it's like, why did I accept this friend request? I don't want to talk to this person. So I've gotten addicted to that, dude. I like it, it dude. It's so fun. Like, no, dude, I'm, I'm and blocking, just becoming a ghost to this person. It's like they can't, but, but here's the thing. They don't even notice. They yeah. probably don't notice. They don't notice if you, you know. Them. That's that's a funny no. thing. That's a funny thing though, because I've I've um I've become I've been so selective in social media where like you know I will get like a notification. Like literally recently, I got a notification that a guy that I knew when I was like a kid, like when I was like six, <laughs> yeah, he like sent me a friend request, and I went delete. <laughs> <laughs> like, nope. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. What is this about? I'm not interested. Like, don't. Yeah. I don't need to talk to you. No, I know. <laughs> yeah, I think it just. I want to go back to the way it used to be when we were kids, where it's just like you're just in your burrow. If someone moves away, you just it's, that's it. You just never hear about them again. Mm. Like, I kind of like that, dude. I like that about. That's something we're we're missing in life now. I think. I think we're. I think all of this like yeah, weird really connection. Yeah. Yeah, I think it, I think it puts us on blast. It makes us feel like we're part of this like big hive mind almost, and I yeah. think we need to get away from that and almost like you know. Yeah. Now, I know I might be coming across almost like a back to the land hippie here, but it really is like I think we need to get back to just freaking you know yeah. our own burrows with our own like you know just you know. Focus on the people who matter to you, you know? It's interesting. There is a, a – this is kind of a side thing, but this is a fucking cold film, Tannis. There is a yeah, – Yeah, a, yeah. Let's a, get the, there's a manga move on. Um, by the name of I Am A Hero. Um, and it's a zombie manga. Really great. Um, give me a second to, like, speak. I Am A Hero. I want to just shout out the author um, of the manga. Um, it is a manga by Kengo Hanazawa. Um, and it is a zombie manga. Um, and it is again, you know, Japanese gra- Japanese graphic novel. Um, that's what manga means for those who don't know. Um, and that manga starts literally just starts as like a zombie manga, and it's just like a you know, 
what if there was a zombie apocalypse in Japan? And and it's a fascinating idea. Like, I feel like having a zombie movie or a zombie thing in Japan is a more fascinating idea than like a zombie thing in the U.S. Because the zombie, the whole zombie thing in the U.S. is so fucking lame. Um, yeah. But in Japan, it's interesting because of the 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 um, laws around fire weapons and firearms. You know, it's very strict. And very few citizens actually possess them. And to possess a firearm is very rigorous. And you have to constantly, like, maintain it. You have to do, like, every six months, like, tests and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> so it's a very rigorous process. And uh, to me, that's why it's fascinating to have, like, a, an apocalypse set in that setting. Because of, like, how interesting that is. Because um, you have to get creative, you know. Um, where it's like you watch The Walking Dead and everybody has fucking guns and it's like well who gives a fuck you know you have a fucking automatic fucking <laughs> weapon like who cares like it's boring <laughs> yeah. You know? um, yeah but in this in this graphic novel in this manga spoilers to I am a hero it, kind of but kind of I'm not really gonna go into detail um, but it turns out that you know in the long term of the story the zombies are becoming this mass yeah like they're just every person that becomes a zombie then eventually just like kind of joins with another person. And then eventually every human being becomes a huge mass. And mm. the, the graphic novel equates it to like being in like Reddit, like a forum, you know, where then you just become this like huge hive mind. And then yeah. the question becomes existential in the graphic novel where it's literally about a matter of like, do you keep resisting joining this hive mind that human beings you know because it basically presented being a zombie t to like a new step of evolution you know and then it became a question of like do you reject the hive mind for autonomy or do you like join it which i thought it was fascinating it was controversial like kind of like that take at the time like where the manga went at the time so people just wanted it to be like another one of another like kind of middle of the road like zombie bullshit but yeah. I think it's fascinating because I think the way that that story went has made it to so that it's actually very, um, how do you say that, um, modern. Like it feels like really current. Timely. Yeah, it feels timely. It feels timely because of that because I feel like that's really kind of what you and I are talking about. Because it's like you're literally talking about rejecting this like weird like hive mind that human beings are kind of moving towards, you know. And that's really what scares me too, like about like Neuralink and like all that BS yeah. that, keep, that they keep pushing forward of like putting like a computer in your brain and stuff like that. Because it's like I don't want to be part of any fucking singularity. <laughs> like no. that's scary. God damn, dude. You know? Oh yeah. Oh dude. Like I mean, what you're basically saying it, it reminds me a lot of the Borg from Star Trek. It's essentially just the zombie version of that. Mm -hmm. Uh, or like the flood from Halo or whatever, you know, and, and the the Borg always really scared me. Like when I was younger, like as a kid, I thought the Borg was one of the scariest things because it's the same thing. It's like this machine, you know, these these cyborgs basically. And then if you get captured by them, they plug you in, you know, and then you're part of the, the hive mind essentially. Yeah, it, it that that is the scariest thing to not be an individual anymore. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, no, I think we are giving up our individualism kind of, you know, and people can say, well, you can express yourself as an individual on Facebook and <laughs> <laughs> on, on the Facebook. On the Facebook. Uh, I turned into James Bond there. Uh, I can present myself on the Facebook. What is know, it, that's um, more like Bane. Sean Connery? Yeah, you're either Sean Connery or yeah. Bane. <laughs> it's like a mix between the two. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, we're going to get on Facebook. And we're going to uh, <laughs> we're going to get on Facebook, and we're going to make up stories you know, about how we overheard conversations in the local cafe. You know, I feel like um, Tom Hardy's Bane would be a great politician. I feel like he would be such a great oh, politician. Yeah, but not only yeah. that, but not only that, he would be great at debating because you couldn't, you know, he would, you know, like let's say I'm, let's say I am me and I'm debating Bane and we're running for presidency yeah. and it goes like, oh, what do you think about foreign policy? And I go like, well, this and that and this about foreign policy. And then, you know, Bane just goes like, rawr, 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 rawr. <laughs> so then everybody <laughs> just kind of looks at him like, what did he just, what did he just say? I feel like, <laughs> I feel like that's more effective. I feel like that's a more effective 
way of political jargon that one actually politicians do, which is just not answer the question. Right. <laughs> yeah, the gish galloping yeah. that they do. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's like basically just another version of what Donald Trump does, where they're just yeah. like, so Donald Trump, what are you going to do about health care? And he's just like, listen, we're going to have the best health care. We're also going to bring back Merry Christmas. We're going to have Merry Christmas. We're going to bring back so Merry Christmas. Just, we are going to say goes Merry right, Christmas. It goes right that way. And people are going to be happy and healthy, and we're going to have lots of Christmas trees. We're going to have Christmas trees. We're going to bring back Merry Christmas. And they're like, uh, but the health care. Listen, that is a rude, terrible question. You should be fired and killed. You should be fired and shot by a firing squad. You should be fired. Uh, yeah. Dude, that would be the best, man. Bane in a political debate. That would be great. I'd love to see that. Oh. Somebody should animate that. Somebody should do something Hell yeah. about that. Hell yeah, dude. Well, they want to take away our firearms. <laughs> I want to take away our firearms. They said no one should. <laughs> now it's turning into Bill Cosby. <laughs> it is. It was, dude. It really totally was turning into Bill Cosby. They want to take away the firearms. They want to take away our pudding. <laughs> <laughs> they want to take away our firearms, so we can't shoot the AR-15s anymore. Batman <laughs> wants to take away the firearms. And he's like, and like Batman is like the other guy. He's like, oh, look. <laughs> yeah. look. I don't want to do that. I just want to establish reasonable. <laughs> we need better background checks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and a full ban on assault weapons. <laughs> Batman here wants people to invade your home. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Dude, I, I think that, that impression really came together, man. That I did come I together. Did it. For me to do Bane, I have to put like a cup in front of my mouth. I have to put like a cup and then do it. I can't do it just out of sheer will. You know, it's funny. I did it last uh, on an episode like sometime last year. And I think I did it like that where I put my hand over my mouth. But I think it actually sounds better without the hand over, over my mouth. Yeah, I have, to put some, I have to put something over my mouth to do that. I've got to put a mask over your oh. People, no one cared who I was till I put on the mask. What, it, what, it, what was the thing that you and I quoted that one time that made us and oh, yeah. the other For you. Jake? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I laced him. For yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> if I pull that off, will you die? It would be extremely painful. <laughs> You're a big guy. You're a big guy. <laughs> yeah. For you. you. Yeah, I, I remember that. I like. I like shorten it, right? Was it like, was like out of, you just said it out of context. Out of, you're for a big like guy. Last... <laughs> For you. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> Everybody, you immediately knew like, you were, what scene you were pulling that for, from. Um, oh but oh yeah, dude, I I had an idea for. Um, uh, freaking, um, a, a, a little, you know, a little, a little film activity we could do here, dude. So, um, you know, we all kind of know the whole concept of film ripoffs and film copycats, right? You know, like, like Suicide Squad was just trying to do what Guardians of the Galaxy did or, yeah. you, you know, just stuff like that. Yeah. And, um, you know, there's a whole, there's kind of a whole, um, you know, that's kind of a thing. Like, there's twin films out there, right? And what I wanted to do was a twin film showdown where we pick between two very similar films that came out around the same time. Okay. And there's a whole Wikipedia page. If you look up twin films on Wikipedia, it will come up. It, basically, to be a twin film, it, they have to have extremely similar um, content and then also have come out either on this in the same year or around the same let me ask year, you like this. within like one or two years uh, is one of them there will be blood and no country for old men no actually but that's actually a good one dude okay. i didn't find that one we can use i, that I want okay what, what would you choose between those two let's start with that one okay so <clears throat> fuck there will be blood 2007 directed by paul thomas anderson and mm. no country for old men 2007, directed by the Coen Brothers, both films were nominated for a shit ton of Oscars, and basically the Oscars were split between the two of them. Um, Paul lost director, as he always does, and he went to the Coen Brothers. Um, and 
No Way Blood lost film of the year, like Best Picture, and it went to No Country for Old Men. But No Way Blood did win Best Actor, and it also won Best Cinematography. Um, but it lost, sadly, Best Score. Um, this is just random. This is off the top of my fucking head. This is just random film knowledge. Um, yeah. If I were to choose between There Will Be Blood, what most people argue is the best Paul Thomas Anderson film, including fucking... You know who I want to, to interview Paul Thomas Anderson? Joe Rogan, because he talks about this movie all the time. He likes... Every time that he, he has an opportunity to say what his favorite movie is, he's like, oh, There Will Be Blood. Um, oh, interesting. But okay. uh, most people feel, think that this is his best film. And those people, I'm not going to say they're wrong. The only people that I would ever say they're wrong is the people who say that Boogie Nights is his best film. I think those people are wrong. If you're one of those people, Jake, you're wrong. Um, most people <laughs> want to say that that's his best movie. Um, and then the Coen Brothers of Country for All Men, most people also say that's their best film. Um, if I were to choose, I would pick... No, no, that would be blood. Oh, you almost, you almost, you almost went the... Uh... You almost went the no country route. Yeah. Um, I have no country for old men rated like one point higher than there will be blood. I have them rated uh, the no same countries. Thing. What nine out of ten? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I gave there will be blood eight out of ten. I I feel like I need to rewatch there will no, be blood. I think blood, they're both though. just as good as each other. The reason why I'm picking, actually, let me. I, I'm gonna let you finish. I'm gonna let you finish. <laughs> uh. Yeah, so here's the thing. I've seen no, no Country for Old Men a handful of times. I've only seen There Will Be Blood once, maybe like four years ago. So, yeah, it's hard for me to... I want to like There Will Be Blood more um, at this point because I do have issues. I, I've discussed it on a past episode uh, of Film Tangent, so I won't really go into it. But I do have issues with like the final act of No Country for Old Men yeah. where it's... I just feel it is egregiously anticlimactic, and I know I, I went over it on the last episode on the episode where I discussed it. But people will say, "Oh, that's the point. That's the point. That's yeah. the point." And to that, I say, "Cool. Well, it's still anticlimactic, and they gave up a lot of what they were building toward." Um, and I've read the book too, and and so I mean, it ultimately kind of falls on the book overall because they were very accurate to the book. They yeah. only, you know, they just deleted like a couple scenes from the book and changed it a few things Mm -hmm. um so yeah so i I want i will i will say no country for old men right now but i i want i suspect that if i rewatch there would be blood i could probably like that one better honestly yeah i i want to like there will be blood better yeah yeah my that was a good one dude my reasoning for this for for putting there will be blood above no country for old men one is music wise i really appreciate johnny greenwood's score and i think it's like such a beautiful part of that film and it's so memorable i think about that score just think about that movie i think about that score um another thing is i really love daniel day lewis like daniel day lewis is like one of my favorite actors like ever you know and so much so that two of two movies that he's in i've given a 10 out of 10 to you know which is in the name of the father and phantom thread and I think the same is true about Joaquin, because I think her, is, I have her as a 10 and I have the master as a 10, so they're tied. Um, mm-hmm. those are, I think I would say those are my two favorite, like, male actors. Um, I love him. I love that performance that he has in that film. Um, and also, in terms of, like, visual direction, Paul Thomas Anderson remains, like, my favorite live-action director in terms of just, like, visual cohesion and decision-making. Mm-hmm and craft and the language that he uses i have a huge amount of appreciation for that and also that i feel like in terms of like artistic expression you know in terms of composition and in terms of almost i guess just like creative liberties um i champion paul thomas anderson because they're both based on books but for paul thomas anderson he basically made that whole story up like it's not like a direct one-to-one translation from the book oil it's not you know Right, right. So he actually concocted that. And not only that, but like, again, you know, I feel like the film in and of itself, The Ruby Blood takes a lot of like, there's a lot of breathing room in that film that is dedicated to nothing other than aesthetics. And I have a huge appreciation for that. Um, I mean, 
and also, I mean, you, you have to take into account like the first seven, ten minutes of that movie are like non-verbal, just visual storytelling. And I know that There Will Be Blood has also, I mean, There Will Be Blood, No Country for Old Men is also kind of a champion for that. But I'm going to give it to Paul Thomas Anderson. I think I think he made the quintessential um, neo-Western that year by, yeah. by a hair, like by, yeah. by a hair's yeah. margin. Yeah. I would, yeah, for me, I guess my reasoning, go, just going off the top of my head, like with No Country for Old Men, I do think it's just got like so many great um, suspense elements and, you know, action elements, I guess, that I think are just so well done that it's it's hard to, yeah, it's just hard to right now for me at least put There Will Be Blood above it. Um because, like, you know, you have, like, that scene, just that scene alone where Llewellyn is in the hotel, mm-hmm. you know, and he's waiting on Anton Chigurh to get there, and then Anton busts through, and you don't even see Anton through the whole scene. You just kind of feel his presence, and you see the muzzle flares go off. Like, mm-hmm. so good, man. I mean, um, but, yeah, yeah, it, it's close, though, for me. It's, 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 it's close. It's just close. Like, you know, they're just... They're both just like such great quality films. I would, I would, you know, I would, um, I guess, um, give you a tiny um, push to maybe rewatch. Um, there will be blood. Yeah, uh, I've definitely been meaning to. And, and by the way, I know there will be blood is not that kind of movie. I mean, you wouldn't have any like you know sequences like that, and there yeah. will be blood. There's, but no, there's not shooting sometimes in that movie. No. But sometimes the sometimes movies do have an unfair advantage just by virtue of their genre. Yeah, hundred you know? percent. Like you can just be more intense in certain genres than others, mm-hmm. and sometimes that makes it win out, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, in terms of a hard one to one comparison. Um, all right, dude, I'm gonna rapid fire some of these. If you think of some some other ones too, like shout them out, like movie. I will. You know, twin movies. Yeah. All right, dude. We, we went over this one last week, but Ants versus Bugs Life. That's I'm going right. to go with Bugs Life. Ants <laughs> versus Bugs Life. I remember that I asked you which one Woody Allen. <laughs> it's like, which one's Woody Allen in? Woody Allen's an Ants. I'm pretty sure that he's the main character. Yeah. Uh, yep, that's him. So yep, because, Woody Allen is. because Woody Allen is the main character of Ants, and for no other reason, I've seen both of these movies. I have no actual like appraisal for them. I'm gonna say, Bugs Life. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. No, I, Bugs Life's a classic, man. I've only seen Ants once when I was a kid. I've seen the Bugs Life many times. Bugs Life is a Pixar classic. Yeah. I think it's really underrated. Um, you know, it's it's definitely just a favorite for my childhood. And I also think the design of the ants is more pleasing Superior. to the eye yeah, in Bugs it, Life. It is because they look gross and weird and uncanny and ants but bugs life did the right thing by just making them like really cartoonish and blue so they don't they actually look like just you know cartoon characters which i think is ultimately better Uh, there's no like uncanny valley with them um and yeah i think bugs life just has a solid like adventure Mm -hmm. you know story to it uh Okay, the next one I have another Pixar versus DreamWorks. I got Finding Nemo versus Shark Tale, dude. <laughs> Finding Nemo versus Shark Tale. Shark Tale, the movie that features Will Smith. Yeah. And Martin Scorsese, right? And like Robert De Niro. Yeah, as the buffer fish. Yeah. yeah. And Robert De Niro as the shark. Yeah. And Jack Black as the other shark. That's right. Um, uh look man if you asked me right this second like right now which movie i would rather watch shark tale or finding nemo i would say shark tale really <laughs> like right now <laughs> i would rather watch shark tale because i feel like i'm probably gonna have more fun watching that movie than finding nemo i've seen finding nemo a lot of times finding nemo is the better movie um for sure so if yeah. if it, you know, in terms of like which movie is better, fucking Finding Nemo. But to, yeah. to give Shark Tale the, a bone, and it is that if 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 you asked me, I think in any actual given day, like which one I would rather watch, I think I would watch Shark Tale. Yeah, well, Shark Tale is like so bad it's good, kind of exactly. Yeah. Like I think maybe last year, or the year before, like on Fourth of July, like we were with our family friends and all of the like millennials and Gen Zers of of the three families we were with like all sat down and we were like let's watch something nostalgic let's watch shark tale you know and it was like 
I'm watching it and I'm like, this is so stupid. Yeah. Like it's all, you know, finding Nemo felt very, the world that they were in. It was like, okay, this is the ocean, but it's just talking fish where shark tail, they were like, no, we're going to have a bunch of like shops and stuff and it's all going to be fish puns. And like, you know, there's a whale wash and, and the humor is really dumb and try hard. Like even when I was a kid, I thought the humor in shark tail was really try hard. Like it just felt like the writers were like, you know, are, are you laughing? Are you laughing? Are we funny now? Yeah. Are we funny now? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Whereas like Nemo, Finding Nemo, as Pixar tends to do, it's like, you know, it just comes out naturally through the story and they're not constantly just making like joke, 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 joke. Like Shark Tale felt very like, are we funny? Are we funny? Are we funny? Are we funny? <laughs> That movie's obnoxious, so yeah, I, I gotta go with Finding Nemo. I mean, yeah, of course, Shark Tale's got like a, you know, a place in my heart as far as like a childhood movie, but that's really it. It's 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 bad, and and Will Smith's character's so annoying in that movie too. I haven't I, have to, I haven't seen that movie in such a long time. All right, dude, we got a couple more animated ones, and then I'm gonna throw some some other ones at you. I got uh, we got Over the Hedge versus Open Season. Over the Hedge versus Open Season. Over the Hedge. Open Season is the one with the bear, right? Yeah. And then Over the Hedge is with the turtle and the raccoon. That's or right. I am going to choose Open Season. Yeah, same. I, I've only seen Over the Hedge once. Yeah, same here. And maybe I might have seen Open Season twice. I've seen it a as few a times. Kid. Yeah. I've seen I saw it recently. I saw Open Season maybe like I saw Open Season within the last four, three, four years. Really? Yeah. I I haven't seen both of them have been like at least, you know, over a decade since I've seen them, but I would go with Open Season cuz I remember even as a kid too I had the video game, so there's a the little video more game nostalgia. Is cool. there. I had that video game too. Oh, did you? Yeah, yeah man. <laughs> yeah, and I remember like I also, the, I, had, I also had the Over the Hedge open like video game and I also liked that one. Though. Okay. Was Open was Over the Hedge Dreamworks or Pixar? None of them are Pixar. It must be. I think they might both be DreamWorks. I don't know, or maybe they're like a different thing. They're not. They're not Pixar. I know. Yeah, I know. Open Seasons not Pixar. What's Over the Hedge? Over the Hedge is DreamWorks too. Interesting. What the hell was Open Season? Who made that? Not either. Not Pixar or DreamWorks. Illumination. Um. Who did that? Columbia Pictures. Sony Pictures Animation. Huh. Uh, the first film from that company. Oh, so the people who did um, Spider Verse, they did Surfs Up, Cloudy with a Chance to Meet Balls. Oh, Sur- okay, Surfs Up's a classic. But no, I like Open Season, man. I like the the whole idea with that with that movie of like this like kind of like domesticated like bear, yeah. you know. And I also like his like little like um, elk deer friend. Um, <laughs> yeah, man. I, I like the movie, man. I like the movie. The movie's fun. I like Open Season. Well, the next one I got is Happy Feet versus Surf's Up, dude. Mm, this ain't no competition. Yeah, one of the yeah. greatest animated, cool-ass movies ever made is Surf's Up. I'm going to stand oh, yeah. by Surf's Up. Happy Surf's Feet up, can go bro. fuck itself. Or like <laughs> <laughs> Happy Feet was way too freaking depressing, Who directed man. that? Isn't it the same guy that made Mad Max? George Martin? What is it? George Martin? Is that his name? George Miller? George Miller. Yeah, he directed Happy Feet. Screw yourself. Oh, my God. Just like, the Mad Max director directed Happy Feet? Yeah, it was what George Miller. Heck? Yeah. What? Yeah. That's look insane. I'm not lying to you. That's wild. Yep. How does that happen? Yeah. Happy Feet was, uh, I won't, again, here's the thing. Traumatized so kind of, this movie. That movie traumatized me, dude. Oh, yeah, man. Dude, the, the penguin, it finds love. Then gets trying to be then as he's like being heroic, gets kidnapped and put in an aquarium, which is like the most depressing, the most depressing thing, thing, ever. thing ever. Then I don't remember how he gets out of the aquarium, but he gets out. And when he they comes take back, him his, back, his they mate take him back re- and they put like an antenna. On oh, him. yeah. Yeah. And then his mate like remarried or something yeah. so gotta, oh, so you, and yeah. had kids. It's terrible. Oh, my it's terrible. God. And then he just comes back and does a little happy dance. And then they all dance, oh. the movie ends, the movie specs you to think it's like all cool, and it's like, this is that cool? Oh, this is that cool that you're doing God. this movie. 
Oh, I mean, that's dude. That's Spawn. That's what happened to Spawn. That's Spawn's whole thing. He like go <laughs> dies, goes to hell, and then when he comes back, his Spawn, his wife's like married to his best friend and has a kid with him. Like <laughs> it's like they did that in Happy in a Happy, Kids movie. Happy Feet, Happy Feet exists to show you that there's always another way. It's like there's there's always <laughs> another option. You don't you don't have to choose violence. You can just choose to be a little happy little guy and to just tap yeah. your feet. You can just choose that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. Um, because he doesn't like get his mate back, right? I no, mean, that, I don't kind think of, so. That would send a weird message to kids, like, no. "Oh, get her back." And, yeah, no, <laughs> no. He just, he just takes the L. He takes the L graciously, dude. Oh, yeah. uh, so I, dude, that depressed the shit out of me. But, but the, surfs up is like so much. Exactly, fun. so much fun, dude. Surfs up so about this this guy that he just doesn't want to be in the cold. He, you know, he he, he makes this journey. He's in this island, you know, he gets to this island where it's all about surfing, all about being great. You know, he gets taught how to be a great surfer by this super, super rad fucking other penguin. He has a lot of interest. He gets her in the end. It's all about yeah. surfing. It has a competition element, which makes your heart, you know, pound. Like, oh, my God, it's going to do it, you know. And it's really great. It's greatly animated. It's really unique because it's like a mockumentary and it has this, like, documentary thing going and Shia LaBeouf plays uh, the the voice, and he's pretty cool. That's a pretty cool thing, you know. I know yeah. that Shia LaBeouf is not that cool these days, but you know, for a right, while, I feel right. that was a cool thing. Um, Surfers up, is, Surfers up is fucking great, dude. I love that movie. And Surfers up is hilarious too. I was laughing my ass off when I was a kid at that movie. Yeah, it was great, man. Come to think of it, that movie shares a lot of plot elements with Car, the movie Cars. Like, a, you know, he like gets training from this old, like, uh, you know, veteran who's mm-hmm. like you know, cynical, you know? Um, but anyway, sort of so, shit, uh, all right, next one I got, I, only you can speak on this. Cause I've only seen one of these movies knocked up versus Juno. Uh, you've seen Juno, right? Yeah. I've seen Juno. Juno's a, seen Juno's the better up. movie by far. Juno doesn't have Seth Rogen. Huge, like <laughs> plus 10, like alley up, <laughs> like dunk. <laughs> <laughs> like holy shit no, what's your problem with seth rogan no man? seth rogan meaning no weird seth rogan like laugh that makes you feel like you're like struggling to breathe when he laughs and he goes like oh, oh, what is he gonna <laughs> yeah. breathe when he's gonna take a pause <laughs> and breathe you know none of that um katherine high goes all right she's actually the better the better part of that movie um yeah. And you know, there's a, there's some cool guys in there because I think, if I remember correctly, um, Jason Segel's in that movie, and like some other guys, like friends of of um, the usual crew that shows up in Seth Rogen movies around that time. Knocked Up is not a bad movie, and it's entertaining, but it's just kind of one of those movies that's like really dated because Seth Rogen just plays like this kind of like kind of like weird like looser guy, and you know, it, it, a lot of the, a lot of parts of the movie just kind of make you uncomfortable. Um, and, it's, yeah. and it, it, it has that usual, it has that kind of Seth Rogen, not Seth Rogen, Adam Sandler blueprint of like, you know, schlubby guy, you know, completely out of his league, you know, mm-hmm. they, with this woman. And, and it's like, well, you're supposed to like, this is supposed to still be believable. But Seth Rogen has no, none of the charisma that Adam Sandler has that makes you feel okay with accepting that <laughs> in his movies. Um, yeah. or, or to root for him in a legitimate way. I feel like Seth Rogen works more. He works, I feel like he figured it out because he works better in movies like, you know, Pineapple Express and The Interview and stuff like that. I don't think he works mm-hmm. very well as like a leading guy. And I think that's probably like why, I think that's partly why he stopped playing those roles. Because um, he was just, he was just doing Adam Sandler movies and he's not Adam Sandler. Um, Juno. Mm-hmm. Juno is just so great. It's a wholesome movie. It has a great message. What's his name? Jason um, J J Simmons. What's his name? Is that his name? J K Simmons. J K Simmons. J K Simmons is great. He's a great dad in that movie. He's like he's such a dad, and you're like, this is the dad everybody needs to have. And Michael Sarah is Michael Sarah, which is fantastic. Um, the movie also has a great soundtrack. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, Juno all the way. It's a better movie. Interesting. Yeah, J K Simmons plays an oddly level-headed character in that yeah, movie right? compared to his other roles. Yeah, very level-headed dad. <laughs> So he's playing like, like a, a psycho dude. He's great. A uh, side note: he's great in the show Oz. Man, I I haven't stuck with that show. I, I kind of I might go back to it, mm. the prison show. But he plays like one of the main antagonists in that show. He's like the leader of a neo Nazi gang in prison. Mm. Real, he's a bastard, dude. In that show, I don't know if uh, you've seen. I don't know if, he, he's great, dude. I don't know if you've seen this, but 
Um, this just came to my head. There's a Seth Rogen movie, because we're talking about fucking Seth Rogen, called Of Servant Reporter, where he plays a mall cop. I thought that that movie could be like a twin off with Paul Blart, <laughs> mall cop. Although I don't know if you've seen Of Servant Reporter. I- Oh no, I haven't seen. I haven't seen yeah, that. Sure. I've I seen Paul that. Blart Mall Cop. But Observer Report is actually pretty funny. I recommend that movie. Is it? Let me add it to my watch list. What's it called? Observer Report. Observe and report with that. Oh, Observe and report. And I believe that um, I forget her name, but she used to be married to. She's his love interest in that movie, I think. Um, the lady that used to be married to what's his name? Chris Pratt. Anna Ferris. Anna Ferris. She's his love interest in that movie. Oh, okay. Interesting. Interesting. All right. Cool. Nice, man. Um, let me see. Uh, I got Despicable Me versus Megamind. Uh, mm, Megamind. Same. Yep. Megamind. <laughs> Megamind. <laughs> it's they're both like, great. It's fun. They're though. both good. They're both good. Like they're both good. I enjoy. I've enjoyed watching both of them. I've seen most of. I think I've seen two of the of the. Despicable Me movies. And the first one is the only one where I could stand the minions because then they just kind of became oh. their own thing and they took too much of that. But Megamind is just so great, man. Just rooting for that guy. Just, mm-hmm. you know, the villain origin story. Watching him from being a little kid and having to be, like, classmates with Superman. Like, um, yeah, yeah, I love I love that movie. And they're making another one. They're making a Megamind too. I heard about that, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Megamind, it's great. I agree with you. Like, that is the appeal of that movie. You're what it, it's very much like an underdog story. Yeah. And it's kind of like the it's almost like a revenge of the nerds thing it in is, a way, yeah. where yeah. like Superman was the jock and mm-hmm. Megamind was the nerd, you mm-hmm. know. Um, but yeah, no, I agree with you hundred percent and Megamind. But Despicable Me is great. Yeah, but I, I would say Megamind's more compelling in that in that sense it is and it spits in the face of this whole thing that we're that we're always fed with like oh you know like when you watch like the Zack Snyder Superman of like Superman was an outsider and and nobody liked him and it's like yeah but you think about it and it's like he was Superman you know it's like what are you talking about I, I like that idea of being like actually Superman was like the asshole that you would have hated you know yeah yeah yeah, yeah definitely but he he does he kind of turns out good in Megamind though too right he does, like yeah. didn't he just he was kind of like he started feeling bad or like jaded or something I, yeah. I don't know yeah it was like during Megamind's evil speech he like used his super speed to like go off and ponder life or something yeah. that, that's like all I remember from that. he he turns around I remember, around. I remember that I remember that he turns the movie gets a little bit complex I remember that yeah. All right, the next one. I don't know if you've. I think you've only, you've only seen one of these, so I, I think maybe only I can speak on this. But I got the raid versus dread. Fuck, I haven't seen dread, but I don't know why anybody in the right mind would ever not choose the raid. Yeah, I gotta go with the raid because I recently rewatched both of those actually, like within the past year, and yeah, like dread's good, but um, and I like dread it. Dread's great in the sense of like it it's kind of cool because it's like, oh, you got this comic book movie that's coming out, but it's not DC or Marvel, you know? So it was kind of cool to see that. And it's like a fun action movie, but there's really not much um in the way of like great character development or themes or anything. It's very much just like, you know, an hour and a half to kill time. But the raid has this very basic like action plot and then Mm. it turns into very like really good stuff like themes about redemption Mm. i mean it's literally the subtitle in the u.s is called the raid redemption Redemption. you know um which is kind of weird because it's the first movie but anyway i digress uh yeah like so because you know they're invading the building and then one of the gang members is the swat team guy's brother Mm -hmm. so it's like oh Mm -hmm. shit what do we do and then there's a lot of like complexity to that. The characters in uh, that uh, movie, so I would say the dude. raid is definitely superior. The raid also, though, has like ten. T- not only is it superior on the character and plot front, but it has like the action is a thousand times better than yeah. Dread. Like Dread is very basic, like 2010s pre John Wick Western shootout kind of stuff with lots of cuts. Mm-hmm. And the raid is the raid where it's like, you know, everybody it's, doing their own stunts. It's the, highly gold, coordinated. It's the gold standard. Like as far as yeah. I'm concerned, as far as I'm concerned, bro, 
there's no greater like fucking movie that displays like combat than that movie in the second one. No, no like, I agree, dude. They're still they're still the gold standard. They're just they're still up there, and I don't know when they're gonna be surpassed. I haven't seen a movie that does better than those two movies. And in my opinion, the Raid Two is like the greatest like hand to hand kind of like action film ever made. I stand on that ground. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, for sure. The only thing that's come close are the John Wick sequels. Yeah. Not even the first John Wick, but the sequels. the sequels. They came they come close, but the 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 thing that makes I think the the thing that makes John Wick less in terms of those action sequences is John Wick while the gun fu stuff is really entertaining and I mean the of course you can't take away like the John Wick sequels having amazing action sequences but there's I think they're kind of held back by the fact that Keanu Reeves all the martial arts that he does in those movies are grappling arts mm-hmm. so if you watch John Wick really notice try to try to see if you can even note it like if you can even um find him throwing a punch or a kick mm-hmm. it's pretty rare actually he re- and that's because all of the martial arts it's like judo jujitsu sambo mm-hmm. are like his main martial arts whereas the raid has these like you know crazy spin kicks head kicks mm-hmm. you know like crescent kicks punches elbows yeah, it, has you know, of, it has a lot of contact points like that exactly there's a lot more striking as well as yeah. grappling and so to get you know i'm getting very technical but i do think that's why the raid action sequences are just that much more pleasing to the eye than the john wick ones yeah um yeah yeah i mean th- those movies are a work of art i await the yeah. day they 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 can outdo those fucking movies yeah, that's uh, pretty tough. That's a tough. Um, that's a tough bar to that's surpass. That's a tough bar to surpass, man. And it also feels like the John Wick movies have just kind of even moved away from the idea of even doing that. Because even with the last John Wick movie, I feel like the movies kind of moved, as, if ever, a step closer towards like fantasy, if that makes sense. The, mm-hmm, the action yeah. just kind of felt even more removed from real life in those movies. In yeah. that last one, anyway, that was that was like my my experience with it. Yeah, I agree. It's like they needed to come up with other other stuff. Like they had John Wick shooting dragon's breath. And yeah, like, <laughs> you know, it's it's dragon's it's, breath gun. And, it's the Mission yeah. Impossible syndrome, dude. Where it's like, well, if if that was the Mission Impossible, then the next one has to be even more impossible. You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah. well, I guess we have to keep escalating the stakes. And it's like, well, in that movie, Tom Cruise ha- hung from a, a plane that was taking off. So in the next one, he's going to fall from space. And it's like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. Um, speaking of John Wick, I got the Equalizer versus John Wick, the first John Wick. John Wick. John Wick. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. For sure. This is the thing. I <clears throat> John Wick, in terms of craft... John Wick, Wick in terms of like iconography and like icon like the the I guess like the the icon status and iconoclasm of that film in and of itself, but yep. the Equalizer because of Denzel, <laughs> but Denzel doesn't mm. outweigh everything else that John Wick has. So John Wick, John Wick over the Equalizer. Yeah, and I think I mentioned this on a recent podcast where we discussed the Equalizer, but the problem I, with the Equalizer is that. It the whole movie. It, it's too easy for Denzel's character to he he barely gets like a scratch in the, yeah. those movies, and he's just able to win every fight super easily. Yeah, and it gets boring because like in John, where I what I like about but I, John. But Wick, remember, I did argue about, against that with you because I actually do like that you, about the Equalizer. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, we were talking about that. How it's like that fantasy. Yeah, yeah. that like kind of power fantasy. Yeah. But I argued that the power fantasy is more uh rewarding when you also feel like when you see the character that you're looking up to also take some licks and then come back from that yeah. like it's just but but it's opinion i'm a, I, you know i i get what you're saying too yeah. i definitely do um but i that's what i appreciate about the first john wick film and the following ones too is that he takes hits and sometimes there's points where you're like oh fuck like this is bad you know i mean in that first one he gets like fucked up you know uh multiple times Mm -hmm. like really badly um 
But yeah, okay, the last one I have here, and this might be one that only I can weigh in on. I don't, I'm not, can't remember if you've seen this. So I got the the remake, the Disney remake of the Jungle Book versus Mowgli: Legend of the Jungle. I have seen the Disney remake remake of the Jungle Book. I have not okay. seen Mowgli: Legend of the Jungle. I did like the Disney like Jungle Book though. Obviously, it feels like at this point, like just John Favreau and autopilot, and it just feels like John Favreau hasn't made like an actual like thing that he's felt passionate about since he made Chef, <laughs> but. <laughs> Um, yeah. yeah, I still thought it was a decent movie. I think I might have given it like a six. Um, I enjoyed it. I had a good time. But... Okay. Yeah, I same here. I think I probably gave it like three stars out of five. Um, but I, I think that Mowgli, Legend of the Jungle is actually better. Um, hmm. That one got more mixed reviews, and I thought it was superior. Because it's like, I think, I haven't read the Rud- Rudyard Kipling Jungle Book, like the actual books. Um but I suspect that Mowgli Legend of the Jungle, if not in plot, is closer to the book in tone at least. But mm-hmm. I'm, I'm suspecting probably in, in terms of plot too. Because I do know that I think in the original Rudyard Kipling book, like Mowgli does kind of gain this like warrior status, you know, and stuff. But like the – yeah, because so Andy Serkis directed That's right. Mowgli Legend of the Jungle and – yeah, I enjoyed that one quite a bit. Like I thought it was very it was darker. Like it was pretty dark and um there's like it reminded me a lot of like an 80s dark fantasy movie kind of where it's like it's supposed to be it's like for kids on paper, but when you watch it it's like actually like oh god, this is this is scary. <laughs> you know, this is kind of like dark, man, you know. Um I don't know, like almost like Return to Oz or something like mm-hmm. those types of movies from the '80s or Never mm-hmm. Ending Story, stuff like that. I, that excites um, me. I, I that makes me want to check that movie out. Yeah, I think it's worth checking out, man. Because um, they they just went in a different direction, and I just thought it was more original. You know, like the Disney Jungle Book remake. It was like, all right, it's a remake, and it's all the same plot beats, and you know, and and one thing I didn't like about the jungle Disney's jungle book remake was so when I was a kid, I was a huge fan of the cartoon of the old animated version. And one thing that I loved about the original jungle book from the sixties, the animated one is that the way they handled the villain, the tiger Shere Khan, what they do in that movie is you hear him come up his name like people talk about him the whole movie you just hear Shere Khan Shere Khan Shere Khan like people talking about him like he's like the worst ever you know and he's so scary and they build him up but they don't show him until like the beginning of the third act and I always loved that Mm -hmm. Um, like he he just he doesn't come in until the beginning of the third act and then he starts having scenes I always loved that because it 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 was just great like they built him up and then you know you get this reveal and I thought for, especially for a kid's thing, I was like, that's a really great way to handle a villain. And they ruined, John Favreau did not go that route at all. He introduces Shere Khan in like the first couple scenes. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, you know, and then he's doing that whole thing where he's like by the watering hole, like bullying the wolves. Yeah, that's and right, stuff. that's right, that's right. Yeah. And it's just like, ah, I just, I remember sitting there being like, ah, this is lame. Like it doesn't have that same effect. Mm-hmm. Um, as like just people talking about the villain, you know, the whole time mm-hmm. and building them up. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, hey, buddy, welcome. Um, once again, we took we had a little bit of a break in between here for some 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 toilet breaks. Um, but <laughs> welcome back. We're gonna go into our recaps for the past week or so. Um, I'm, I'm I'm really excited. I'm really happy. Um, I've had a lot of fun with this episode. I feel like this is I feel like this has been like the first, like in a way, like the first actual like we're back episode, if that makes any sense. Um, because we've had such a big like recap like backlog over the past few weeks. Yeah, man. Um, yeah, for sure. But recap wise, I what is it? I watched Hannibal, right? And we well, that was the episode for last week. You know what the funny thing is. Yeah. You know what the funny thing is, Mr. Jake? That what? Do I even have it? Dude, I don't have anything. <laughs> nothing? Dude, nothing listening-wise? I didn't like listen nothing. to No, I guess I've been so, like, kind of, like, 
I, I've been figuring out, I guess, like my new groove with my new situation. I have yeah. nothing. No movies. No shows. I started actually playing a little bit of Bloodborne um, oh, video nice. game. I'm building up to playing Sekiro when I do up probably like text Jack um, in front of the show. Um, be like, dude, I'm Hell fucking yeah. playing um, Sekiro. But yeah, I guess the only real thing is that I've been playing Bloodborne and I'm still like in the first area. But it's been really fun so far and I'm getting used to the new, like the fighting mechanics. I think you would really like Bloodborne, like if if not gameplay-wise, like, aesthetically, because the whole thing with Bloodborne is that, I guess there's, like, this, like, weird, like, Bloodborne pathogen, and everybody is sick. It's making everybody turn into, like, beasts and into monsters. And the whole game, the whole aesthetic is just, like, this dark, gothic aesthetic. And Mm -hmm. it's supposed to be kind of like this horror game, in a sense. And... That dark gothic Very aesthetic. Very Lovecraftian. Exactly, yeah. That dark gothic aesthetic. That dark gothic aesthetic is like matched with this like Lovecraftian like um, cosmic horror element. I think at yeah. some point like Cthulhu like creatures come into the game. Um, I think you would like that game. I think you would like this game. Um, I'm loving it just because I love like Souls games. It's just like Dark Souls in terms of mechanics. Um, but yeah, that's really it for, for my recap. Just, just, <laughs> nice, just one. man. Yeah. No, I remember you guys playing that. You and uh, Evan. Evan. Yeah. Shout um, out to Evan. Love you, buddy. So yeah, you I'm very familiar with like, yeah, I'm very familiar with the aesthetics and everything. I like the vibe uh, of, of Bloodborne. Very great atmosphere. Yeah. They did that like gothic Lovecraftian thing perfectly. That like Victorian kind of setting. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Yeah, it's always kind of interesting too. They're always like Love Lovecraft and gothic horror. There, there's like an intersection between yeah. those two at certain yeah. points as well. You know, like he because he came like he was sort of like shortly after Bram Stoker, I guess. Mm-hmm. You know, so he was like, you know, he was still. I think he was still using a lot of those tropes and and those atmospheres and stuff from gothic horror like Vic, the victorian era yeah but yeah man it's awesome um no dude i mean i'm i'm loving it and i don't know like where i'm where i land with it rating wise everything that i've done except for one thing has brought one thing has brought the game down like a little bit because like, there was like a really bad like boss encounter that i had um otherwise i've i've loved it um so yeah and I, it, it's like peak it's like peak yeah. right now in terms of like peak gameplay like pick gaminess i forget what the name of it is when something is like so itself that it's like you know near perfect i forget what the name but there's a name for that um but yeah and mm. aesthetic wise is it's it's chef's kiss mm, nice man nice what do you get uh, was it i remember that boss fight that you guys had with like the spiders man or whatever that I was remember, hard to I, watch i remember i dude i beat that fight i still remember that yeah. to this day because we like we took turns just like going one after the other to the other to the other and then grinding out like materials yeah because in that game you have to like it's different from dark souls because dark souls every time you die the game gives you back your materials like by materials i mean like your healing potions and stuff like that and in Bloodborne, like your healing items and like your bullets and that kind of stuff, you have to either purchase them or, or grind them out and get them from like loot them from like enemies and stuff like that. So I remember that yeah. that was such a, a grind with us, like by fighting that boss, because we would just lose and then have to grind a bunch of have to grind a bunch of materials. We had to I remember that at one point we grind so much that we had like a hundred like blood vials to to like heal ourselves i was like okay we have enough to go shit. fight it again you know then we'll go fight yeah. it again oof I, I were you there when we beat it or were you not i might have been there was i a know crowd. you guys when we beat it there was a crowd the ceiling, yeah. dude. you guys went through the roof yeah. man yeah yeah there was a crowd I, I, yeah like i dude i remember that moment vividly because there was like multiple people in that room um james was in that room and gabby and some people that i will not mention were also in there um <laughs> some people that will go unmentioned were there and i just don't know if you were there but i remember we were listening to music and we were specifically playing um a song by the strokes 
and it was a song by there's but i think it was like 80s come down machine that we were listening to and i beat that boss to that song i was like grooving i Hell was like yeah. in the song in, in the zone dude and i mean i remember that moment clearly like it was a moment of pure like catharsis <laughs> Hell yeah. uh, this is the power of video back. games man but yeah i'm playing fucking playing bloodborne awesome man yeah for me i didn't watch any movies um i let's see yeah i haven't really been watching many things um music wise i've been listening to denzel curry quite a bit Mm -hmm. um his new album's great go listen to it uh so good so good man my favorite songs right now at least are black flag freestyle and ultra shit um i haven't listened but to i yet. need that's oh, so good you will not be disappointed man but yeah so i've been going down the denzel rabbit hole just i'm you know he doesn't have like that much I, he has like six albums or something like that let's see one two three four five six seven albums at least available on streaming so all of them given an eight by fantana yeah, I mean they're all great. He's but he the, doesn't he's have. King, he's the king of the eights, dude. Yeah, he, he, yeah. Denzel's so good, man. Um, great, just punk rap act. Um, yeah, he's the man. What else is there to say? Uh, dude, did you see that Theo Vaughn interviewed Donald Trump? I saw some clips. Like I saw yeah. them. Like I seen. Like I saw them in my timeline. I did not actually watch it. Yeah, I watched like a few minutes of good it, Theo, dude. I get yeah I mean you know get those views man like but dude I just I don't know how anyone listens to uh Donald Trump for that long like it's just it's he's so like opposite of down to earth it's ridiculous it's mm. just like it's all like the whole thing is just bullshitting bullshitting sales pitch like he just doesn't even talk like a person like he's just sitting there like Theo Vaughn at one point the part that I watched it's like Theo Vaughn asks him like what are some good things you what are some things you like about your your kids like each one of your kids and Donald Trump's like well uh Don Jr he's a great hunter he's really good at hunting he likes all that hunting stuff he's been into that hunting stuff for a long time uh and that's what he's all about he's all about hunting you know it's just like dude are you are you a person or like are you just like a <laughs> like he's he's like a robot or something i don't know he's just the least down-to-earth person i've ever seen in my entire life man i gotta say and it was to say like i remember jack and i we for for like we thought it was funny we were watching like uh some really famous pro golfer went golfing with trump and it's like the same thing like all he does the whole time is i saw like, that oh, look at i that. saw that yeah. Yeah. He's like, oh, look at that. Oh, oh, you, oh, wow, that's really quite look something. Trees, that's really yeah. quite something. Yeah, look at the tree. Oh, this course is beautiful. The course is very beautiful. You know, it's just like, ah, he's just, dude, he's like not even a real g- guy, yeah. you know? Yeah. I feel like being with around him would just be like, oh my God, does this guy, who are you really? Dude? Yeah. Like, who, <laughs> who will the real you? Donald Trump please stand up? Like, like you want, is like there you even want, anything left in there? It's like, like you, you, you want know? to unzip him, but if you unzip him, what's going to come out of there is just like a little, like, um, a little like, <laughs> what do you call those things? A little great, like a little groundhog. It's going to come out of there. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I know. Or, yeah, or like that gray matter alien from Ben Ten, yeah. that, like piloting a Donald Trump machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, he's like he's like the least like personable. I don't know, man, because like he comes off at first like on a superficial level, he, he's super personable. Where he he'll like talk you up, he asks the person questions, blow smoke up your ass, like that's his thing, you know. But then after a while, it's like ah, it's like who is this guy even? I don't know. He he's it's weird man i don't know how anyone could could watch that whole interview honestly um but yeah i read um i finished a book uh like a week ago called you shouldn't have come here it's like a thriller novel (laughs) i gotta say it was like a page turner i read it pretty freaking quick um but i will say the twists there's like two twists that happened i predicted both of them in like the first act um and it, they didn't feel satisfying when they hit either. They just kind of felt rushed and half baked. So overall the book, I can't really speak against its entertainment value because I read it in like three days, but um, basically the plot concerns like this woman who goes to an Airbnb 
um, out in Wyoming, but the owner is like, it's like a ranch. So the owner's still there, like taking care of the ranch. And she like, they like fall in love with each other, but then it starts to appear that he's like hiding secrets. People in the town know things and it just kind of goes from there, you know, um, uh, unraveling this mystery. But I predicted the both twists, like the double twist that was going to happen. And I don't know if it was the author knew that, but it's like, I don't know, man. It's like, as a writer, I feel like you got to go, you got to dig deeper and be like, okay, here's the obvious twist. Here's the second most obvious twist. Let me go for that third twist that no one will see coming. You know, it just felt lazy. Um, so anyway, uh, but it overall, like a, a good read still. Um, and then my, um, I want to I want to recommend uh, for anyone who likes like funny web animated shit. There's a ch- a YouTube channel. Um, I'm going to shout them out right now. I'm gonna, I I don't remember the name of the channel, so I'm going to look them up. But I found them because they do um, uh, an animated series that's like a Caillou parody, but it's like Caillou as a 22 year old. <laughs> oh, it's the one. It's the thing that you sent me. With, like, I, did I send that to you? Yeah, you sent me that with like. <laughs> it was like something like you know, I watched the fucking thing. It was like his dad like wishing that yeah. he could like kill him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, the the YouTube channel is called AOK, and they do like I think they do. Um, I believe they do. They do like a, a an Arthur parody as How well. Is it spelled like they, the, the name of their channel. Oh shit! Uh, it's literally just AOK. Those three letters. Okay. Um. But yeah, they they do a bunch of parodies. But my the the one I like, the, the one I keep coming back for is the are the animated Caillou parodies because it's like just what Edward just said. Basically, it's like, you know, it's uh, <laughs> it's Caillou as a twenty two year old. Because in the show, like I watched the show when I was a little kid, and looking back on it, it's like Caillou was just this spoiled little brat, and whenever he would do something bad, his parents would like not punish him. They would just like kind of like do that whole like seek to understand him you know but it was it's like this it's gonna not turn out great and so there's this like animated thing that they made um explores that caillou is a 22 year old and his dad like dude his dad like wakes up and eats his cereal with like instead of milk he pours like whiskey in it and stuff and he just wants his son to die <laughs> it's it's so it's so fucking funny i highly recommend it um if you're looking for a laugh um I discovered that like months ago, like while we were on, or a month ago, like while we were on hiatus. Yeah, you, but, yeah, you sent it to me during that time. Yeah. And then kind of a guilty pleasure um, on YouTube that I've been <laughs> watching. Cause, you know, I love well, one of my guilty pleasures is uh, like Chris Hansen videos on YouTube. Lately, I've actually been watching this channel called Scammer Payback. You might have seen it where the guy like, he's like a hacker and what he does is like he gets on the phone with these scammers you know these like you know like microsoft tech support scammers or whatever and then he um he hacks them and like deletes all their files (laughs) and like they then they rage rage at him very entertaining incredibly entertaining or sometimes he'll just pretend to be like an old person was very it's called scammer payback scammer payback and so so other videos (laughs) Will just be him, like he'll pretend to be like an old person. He, ha- he even has like a voice modulator that makes him sound like an old woman, and like he'll just be like, you know, the, the scammer will tell him to like click yes, and he'll just be like, okay, I'll click yes. Do you want me to right click or left click? You know, I just waste like thirty minutes of their time, <laughs> and the scammers just go ballistic. It's just it's testing beautiful. their patience. Oh, it's beautiful. I'll send you my favorite. Uh, actually um but that's been a guilty pleasure and then i'll shout out my girlfriend too she um her and i were showing each other some music trading music um recommendations and um she likes folk music Mm, uh and she she, yeah man she got me into this band have you heard of the arcadian wild the arcadian wild yeah Mm -mm. it's a folk band their first album um is really good and yeah i re- i really enjoyed it um what's their first album called i want to shout it out the arcadian wild first album welcome um, 
Yeah, it's got a picture of a ship on it. It might. Oh, I think it's just self-titled. Yeah. Um, it's got like the. It's like a painting of the Mayflower on it, or it looks like the Mayflower, mm-hmm. like Pilgrim ship or whatever. Um, but yeah, they're really good, man. I I, I enjoyed them. So um, I'll check them out. I am a fan. It's of solid. Music. Yeah, it's good stuff if you like folk. I I actually, you know, I was listening to them and I I thought maybe you'd like them. Um, so, yep, I'm glad I remembered that. And that's pretty much. I think that's it for me for the recap. Well, everybody, we've gotten to the point of the show where we end the show. So, yeah. <laughs> so thank you for yeah. being here. See you <laughs> next. No, um, this is the movie of the week part of the show. If you haven't seen the movie, go check it out. It's in the fucking title of the video. Check the movie out and come back here or just watch us and then watch the movie after you hear this. If it excites you, um, whatever we say, do whatever you want. I don't care. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the movie of the week is a moon from 2009 directed by duncan jones son of david bowie and written by nathan parker um if you listened to last episode i chose this movie just because we had a blue full moon event this past monday the moon looked great i went out um, and looked at it while it was out there and turned into a wolf uh, yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> my activities but my wolf activities but yeah, Moon 2009, Duncan Jones, Nathan Parker, starring um, Sam Rockwell in a very fascinating role, and opposite him, a robot named Gerthy, who is, funnily enough, voiced by, um, what's his name? The guy from House of Cards. Uh, Kevin Spacey. Kevin Spacey. Um mm-hmm. What did you think, sir, about this movie? I know you've seen it before, but uh, I, I wonder what you think about it on a rewatch, especially because I saw what you rated it the first time. So I'm interested in hearing what you have to say. Yeah. W- what did I rate it the first time? Because I think I already changed it. Really? I'll tell you I'll tell you after the fact. Don't look at it. Just see let's see if okay. it, let's see if it stays the same or not. I don't know why you re-rated it. Okay. Um yeah, I I yeah, this was a rewatch for me. I don't know. For some reason, I think maybe it hit more on the first watch because this watch, I once I kind of knew what was up, mm-hmm. um, like what the you know mystery was. Which I know this this movie's not like too coy with its mystery. Um, you know, it kind of gives it to you in pretty large bites mm-hmm. as the movie goes. Mm-hmm. But um, I'm not like the biggest fan of hard sci-fi. I guess. Um, at least like, I think ex machina is okay, you know, or, or actually great. Sorry. Um, I thought this movie was okay. Mm. I think ex machina is like, great. That's one of the best forms of hard sci-fi, but I, I like, I don't know. I like when sci-fi gets a little zanier, I guess, like mm-hmm. when we go into more stuff like blade runner, or RoboCop. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I think moon's okay. Um, I think, as far as like doppelgangers go, I think that a movie like Another Earth does that better mm-hmm. and in a more subtle way and thoughtful way. Mm-hmm. Um, I think this movie, it just feels – it felt kind of goofy on my second watch. Like just when, when – especially when they're like wrestling each other and stuff and it's like all these weird cuts. I was just like this is kind of weird mm-hmm. but I don't know, man. I, just, I don't feel like I have too much to say on the rewatch. Like I just – I get what they were going for. You know, it's like this whole thing of like a corporation is evil. They're mm. cloning these guys for cheap labor. And, um, you know, and it's the whole idea of, you know, like you have these two, two halves of the same self, basically. Right. Um, it's kind of exploring the, the idea of the self kind of like another earth is by using doppel, a doppelganger. Um, I would say the best part of this movie, I really like how selfless this character is. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he's like selfless toward himself because yeah. his old dying clone says you go. And then, you know, the, 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 the younger, younger clone says, no, you go, yeah. you know? And I thought that was nice. Overall, I find this movie, a, I find this movie just dull kind yeah. of like, I remember like, cause I didn't really remember it that well until you brought up you know, until you picked it. And I was just kind of like, ah, eh. you know, it, it's very dull. And I know a big part of that is it just takes place on the moon, which yeah, is like this dull on. landscape, yeah. you know? Um, 
I just, yeah, and I don't know how many ideas it really explores all that well in this movie. Like, are the themes really that intricate? Am I missing something? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, yeah, an evil corporation, corporate evil, that's like a big theme in this. And I guess, like, selflessness, but I just don't, ah, I don't know. I don't really know what the, like, big conflict is thematic conflict was in this movie yeah help me out here man am i missing something well it's fascinating um it's fascinating with this movie i i, I guess something i wanted to say too is that that it's interesting that this movie came around the same time that the facebook movie came out a movie that used you know army hammer playing you know two characters mm-hmm. although in that movie there was some cgi to facilitate that but it's it's fascinating with this movie that it's doing the same thing, and I thought this movie did that like very, um, very well. Like it was like yeah. really very professionally like seamless. executed, like seamlessly. Like yeah, it's Sam Rockwell, and it's fucking Sam Rockwell, you know, and they're sharing the same <laughs> yeah. scene. Um, it it this was the first time that I watched this movie. Uh, shouts out to William Totten who who recommended this to me eight years ago. <laughs> Um, I will watch fucking um, what is it, Captain and Commander or whatever it is, the name of the movie. Master and Commander. Master and yeah. Commander. I will watch it. Don't worry, I'm getting there. It took eight years to get this one up. You know, maybe 16 <laughs> years I watch the other one. Um, yeah. <laughs> but it was fascinating because it's. I mean, it's true what you say though that it's like it kind of starts. It, it starts off as like a, a, a as like a 2001: a Space Odyssey kind of film. Where you're just with this guy, you know, and he's already on edge when you meet him. And you're like, shit, this guy's on edge, <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. Like, he's on edge. And you, you understand, like, similarly, he's been there for years by himself on the moon with a fucking robot, you know. Um, and it immediately throws the question of, like, is this a good robot or a bad robot, you know. Um, which that kind of keeps going until the last, like, maybe 20 minutes of the movie, and then it becomes clear, yeah, this is just a good robot. <laughs> um, which is interesting that it was a good robot. It was interesting to me that... That I forgot about. I could have yeah. sworn. I had, like, a false memory, like, Mandela effect of that robot turning bad. Yeah. No, it was like a how It was a good robot. Because that, that's the thing. Yeah. It would have been so generic. And that was the very first thought that I had. I was like, it would yeah. be so fucking generic if this is just another, like, bad robot, like, AI movie... You know, except that this one has, like, emojis, you know? Like, this would be pretty generic if this is just, like, oh, I'm just a mean, bad yeah. robot. Um, but he wasn't. Gertie wasn't. And I actually liked Gertie's character. Like, I liked his character. Um, and I liked what it had to say about artificial, te- like artificial intelligence, you know? Because ultimately what it had to say was that it was capable of, like, making, making like, ethical and moral decisions despite, mm-hmm. like, some kind of programming or despite, like... I don't know, having some kind of, like, algorithmic, like, input of, like, you're supposed to obey, like, the fucking, you know, masters, you know, the overlords of this company or whatever. Um, I don't know about that, though, because just to to jump in, like, because I think it was just, I feel like it was almost like their algorithm backfiring because it's ultimate job it was like the car yeah, yeah like no, no Morty, you're right like, keep you're right. summer safe yeah you no know? you're right in like, the sense that 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 the 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 i guess the duty that it had because he kept repeating it to him was that it, it it was to make sure that he was well or something like that or to look after him or something like that yeah it was just to make sure he he, he was protected and safe at yeah. all times so it bent, going, it bent the rules. The, algorithm, the the thing, the robot did kind of, it seems like the robot did kind of bend the rules for the sake of Sam Rockwell. Although it seems like it bending the rules was probably a faulty programming where it just kind of left the door open for that to happen. Like you're trying, like you're yeah, saying. Yeah, that's um, what I'm saying. It's like non-malicious compliance yeah. where it's like, you know, it's like malicious compliance but not really malicious because it's just like the, it's within the, its programming yeah yeah where like you program something a little too well to where it's just like oh well I don't, you know i didn't want you to do that like <laughs> keep him, you know they it's like they forgot to program it to be like keep him safe unless we're sending guys to or quote unquote rescue kill him, to kill yeah. him. yeah yeah that, in which case don't know. keep him safe yeah yeah so that didn't land for me i didn't feel like the robot was really making any sort of ethical decision or anything no like you're that. right about that. I, I guess i guess I, what i did find interesting though is that at least they didn't go the evil robot way which is like there's such like a fucking yeah. generic way to go about it i mean to oh, such yeah. an extent that even fucking ex machina goes that way i mean in that movie has the fucking evil robot movie um yeah. so i appreciated that i appreciated them just kind of playing against type with that 
Um, and I really like Sam Rockwell. You know, I, that's, I really liked him in the film. I really liked kind of like the whole idea of the movie of just kind of being like, oh, we have this one contractor guy and we had like claws, you know, where like if he fucking died, I guess we didn't, I guess they didn't let him know that. But I guess in his contract, probably in like tiny letters, he said something along the lines of like, if you die, we have, you know, you're contractually obligated to do this task for us for however many years. So we'll just clone you and your clone. Your DNA will continue to, to fulfill yeah. this task, you know. And then we will dispose yeah. of you and so that nobody ever knows that this happened. And we'll just say that you died out of natural, like, you know, accident or whatever. Um so it's, it's like you say, you know, where you just kind of have like this evil corporation. But I feel like the 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 impetus of it all, like the 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 push, the narrative push to to allow this film to happen. I thought that it was good enough to like actually be like a vehicle for what this movie was trying to do. Which I guess, like you said, was really just trying to show um, like the resilience and different aspects of this guy while also having that little bit of veil of mystery, even though it's fucking not there. Like like you said, it gives it to you in like really like big bites. Like, you know, like, oh I I'm getting a lot of information and I think I can put this together myself, you know. Yeah. Um, I mean it's obvious that there's not once you see one clone, it's like, okay, I bet there's a whole vat full of these things. Yeah. And there or a whole vault full of these things. Just this dude is. dying again and again and again and again and again and again. Yeah. Yeah. But well, let me jump in on that though too. So the plot though, it it kind of it really falls apart when you think about it because it's like, is it really cheaper for this corporation to clone a human being yeah. than to hire another guy? I don't know, dude. Get the fuck out of it. Yeah, see, dude, it's like. But, that's, but that's the thing. That's, it, like, it that's, like, 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 that's a, like one of those like unexplained like, like, like things. Eight year olds like yeah. sci fi. It's thing. funny. Like, it's funny that you say that because that just reminds me of like that the commentary for that movie. Um, Armageddon, you know, right? Where Ben Affleck, like, that, uh, by the way, Armageddon is like a what, like a nine, like sci-fi movie directed by yeah. um, what's the name of that guy? The guy directed Transformers, Michael Bay. Michael Bay, and the whole idea of that movie is that they need, they need like miners or something like that, um, to go and like to be astronauts to be. They need miners to go to the moon. To like mine something in the moon, and instead of and the whole thing that Ben Affleck says, like I take said, down an asteroid. Yeah, and the whole and he goes like I said to to Michael Bay, I was like, wouldn't it make more sense that instead of getting miners and training them to be astronauts, why not just get astronauts and train them to be miners? <laughs> and he said to me, yeah. shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> i feel like what you just said is something along those lines it is though see that's the thing small there's there it's one thing for every story has like yeah. small contrivances or conveniences i mean we were going over hannibal last week about yeah. the phone call yep um yep but it's that's one thing but it's another thing um when the entire plot of something just falls apart but I feel for a creator on that because then once the creator you, – you can picture the writer halfway yeah. through being like, wait a second. Oh, holy fuck. fuck. This doesn't make sense. <laughs> yeah. But then be like, oh, well, fuck. I got to finish the script. Yeah. Like, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I mean what do you – I don't – I just didn't see enough like – internal conflict or anything in this movie to where – like what was the dilemma? It's like – you know, I don't know. I don't know. Like the, that, the whole movie is them just solving this mystery that we already know. Yeah, because because that, that's because that's the shitty thing that you're ahead of those guys. Because you're like, like you said, it's like you know. Because you're like I, you know, you're like I fucking know you guys are clones. There's probably a whole fucking like like um warehouse full of you guys, like all the fucking dead guys. You know, the guys have died over the many years. You know, and so it's like you said, where it's like, you know, it's like what. You know, like when you're already ahead of what the characters are trying to do, and at the end of the, I guess it, it at the end of the day, it's like oh, I guess I want them to get away with like living, but they still, you know, but he still left two versions of himself behind because he left like the brand new clone and the old clone, and only one of them survived, you know, and so it's like it just kind of throws up a lot of questions, you know, and even and even with the guy that survived, he might not be inherently the guy that you might have been attached to as a character and be like oh i want that guy to survive you know 
So I don't know. It felt like a it felt like a narrative exercise. It felt like a this movie kind of felt like a filmmaking exercise of like I can make a movie and we can make a movie that if you don't think about it, you'll think it's really clever, you know. Yeah, it's it's like M Night Shyamalan. It really <laughs> like M Night M Night Shyamalan sci fi movie, honestly. Uh, uh, yeah, oh, it's and it's just like a lame movie. Like I wouldn't put this on. I wouldn't like ever like dude if it's like a friday night and mm. you're with people or like Switch with a, you know your girlfriend or something like i'm not gonna put on moon mm. people would be like what the fuck because unless, it's dull unless it's the, unless it's the song by kick cuddy don't Oliver and Kenny. Yeah, exactly yeah then i'd put that then i'd put on moon <laughs> yeah no it just it's a dull ass movie dude it's just so colorless and like ugh, mm. i don't know man it's just a drag man well, I really overrated this thing because I'm pretty sure I gave it like an eight out of ten. No, 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 no. You gave it a six. <laughs> you oh, gave it a I six. Okay. The first time you watched it, you gave it a six, and you gave it a six now. Okay. So I guess you, you, you just kind of. I feel like you feel. I guess you feel the same way you did. Um, because I was. Uh, no, I think it's like a five. I would give it a five. I went on Letterbox to see what you gave it. Something to point out that I I wanted to point out. It is that again, this came out in 2009. This was Duncan Jones' first film. And this was the first film by Nathan Parker, the writer of this movie. Excuse me. So this was the first film by both of these guys. And this film led to both of these guys having a level of like critical acclaim. Like the, the, the writer guy, Nathan Parker, who got nominated for a lot of things. Um, like he got nominated for a lot of different things. Um, when this movie came out, in terms of like his writing achievement... And the same thing for Duncan Jones. Like, this kind of skyrocketed to him. And it was like, who is that guy? And it's like, oh, he's the son of David Bowie? Why is his name, his name fucking Duncan Jones? Um, but it did a lot for these guys. And the funny thing is that they have, each of them have done, like, have had their own kind of creative endeavors after the fact this thing came out with, you know, what's his name? Nathan Parker making a bunch of things after this. And then, you know, Duncan Jones made a bunch of movies after this. And the one thing that I want to point out from this is that this movie, in terms of critical success, was the peak of both of these guys' careers. (laughs) They both started at this movie and they peaked at this movie. Everything they've made since then has been either a critical failure or a commercial failure or something in between. Yeah. Okay. So Duncan Jones did Warcraft, mm-hmm. which that was that was a horrible like critical failure. I don't even know if it made money. Oh, he did Source Code. Source Code was good, man. He did do Source Code. We don't talk about that movie. No, that movie's forgotten. But that was great. He, I, I haven't seen that since it came out. Um, and I remember it being great. I, I actually want to watch that again. Really, I should check it out. Maybe, maybe. Maybe it's that was Duncan Jones' last good, last good movie. Yeah, because everything I mean, he's made, certainly everything he's made, this one. yeah, everything he's made since then was has doesn't have good reviews. And he has a movie coming out like I guess next year called Rogue Trooper. I don't know what the fuck that's about. Yeah, I don't know. The wife in this movie is um, played by Dominique McElligot. She's um, she plays Queen Maeve in The Boys. Uh, that's like the Wonder Woman parody. Mm. Forgot she was in this. I didn't know who she was the first time I watched it, but shouts out. But uh, what would you rate this movie? I guess for Moon, for Mr. Jones, um, I think I will give it exactly what you gave it. I think I'll give it a six. I know that you're probably taking it down to a five. I, yeah, I, I will give it a six. I will keep it at a six. Because despite the movie's many flaws, narratively and obviously plot-wise, I did enjoy it. I was not like, I didn't, I didn't, I was not bored watching this movie. I was say this was my first time. You watched this for the second time and you went from a six to a five. And it probably yeah. will be the case for me if I did the same thing. Um, I was just going to give it like a low six. Obviously, you can't okay. show that it's a low six on, on Letterboxd unless I put a six <laughs> and then write low on the comment. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Just a six for me a six for me for mr duncan jones nice respect all right cool man well sir what do you have for us for the next tangents 
Well, for the next tangents, dude, I wanted to do something um, like a newer film. Um, I had a few in mind, but they're just dude. Movies these days are so long, dude, like two and a half hours, man. And like, uh, I'm just like, man, you know, I don't I feel like I can't subject us to that yeah. you know yeah, if like, you, if you uh, wanted I, me to watch a, a three hour long movie i'll watch it oh man um yeah let me see if you're cool with that let's let's watch the um, let's see i'm like i'm like between furiosa or oh. or kingdom of the planet of the apes furiosa is on streaming now right like it's on on max I think. I think, yeah. And then Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes on Hulu. So our cup runneth over. Either way, I don't have Hulu, but I I can watch it anyway. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Whichever one you want. Choose whichever one you want. That's the one we'll watch. Yeah. Let's do Furiosa. I'll get us more clicks. Get us more advertising (laughs) money from from the zero advertisers that that. we make right now. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, but that's next week, everybody. It's Furiosa, a Mad Max saga. I'm excited. Get hyped. Get hyped. Thanks for watching, everybody. Next time on Film Tangents. See ya.